Yes now, bless now. Don't forget the rest now, people. Des Rock Steady at King of the Pit TV signing in. Following on from our heavy metal deep dive, we're going to continue on. Okay, we've gotten to lyrical themes now. Let's see what we're saying about the lyric and let's go on for a little bit further. Uh, we've just learned about, you know, the roots of heavy metal, so to speak, a brief overview. I think we do have history coming up uh, in this article. But this one is lyrical theme and we've got a most descriptive list here. See heavy metal lyrics. Uh, we're not going to bother with that. We're going to read this article. So according to David Hatch and Stephen Millward, Sabbath and the numerous heavy metal bands that they inspired have concentrated lyrically on dark and depressing subject matter. To an extent, uh, I don't know that word, unprecedented in any forms of pop music. They take as an example Black Sabbath's second album, Paranoid, which included songs dealing with personal trauma, Paranoid and Fairies Wear Boots, which described the unsavoury side effects of drug taking, as well as those confronting wider issues, such as the self-explanatory War Pigs and Hand of Doom. Deriving from the genre's roots and blues music, sex is another important topic, which is funny because metalheads get no sex. <laughs> A thread running from Led Zeppelin's suggestive lyrics to the more explicit references of glam metal and new metal bands. Yo, metalheads, right? You know, you know what it's like, dude. Ninety-nine percent men. Metal is a sausage fest. Maybe it should be more inclusive. Maybe it just attracts men for whatever reasons. But yeah, I know metalheads get no sex. Unless, unless, unless you're that good-looking, tall, bloody, um, you know what I mean, angelic, elf-looking guy at the event. Then he's got free reign. He's a legend. You've all got one in your circuit. You've all got one. The thematic content of heavy metal has long been a target of uh, criticism, according to my man John. Who is this? He's been referenced twice now. He's an American journalist who's the chief popular music critic in the arts section of the New York Times. Oh! Heavy metal's main subject matter is simple and virtually universal with grunts, moans and uh, subliterary lyrics. It celebrates a party without limits. The bulk of the music is style. So let's just uh, talk on my opinion on lyrical themes now, or at least one opinion. Um, I mean, they've covered relatively light lyrical themes. Obviously, it's heavy to an extent, but of course, when you get into the extreme bands, there's a lot of just gruesome, grotesque, and emphasis on just bad stuff. And me personally, I think it does affect your life, yeah? I think there is a knock on effect. Such as the metalhead being the antisocial, outsided, outcasted person, yeah? They find comfort in metal because it speaks to that. But it also emphasises that. I personally think going around listening to negative music all day. And this is punk rock and anti-whatever, anti-establishment, anti-world we live in music, yeah? I think it's very heavy and unconsciously weighs you down a lot. Uh, and I speak from experience, I mean, I was going to work, I remember a turning point, I was going to work uh, more than a decade ago, yeah, and I used to listen to, I was, it's just constant, man, constant, 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 and I go through f flows of listening to different musics and really getting into different musics, and I just went through a period of listening to a lot of Trojan reggae ska music, right, and the more I started to listen to a little more of an upbeat uplifting rhythm, albeit lyrically some of it might be a bit mongy. It changed the way I was walking into that workplace. It changed how I dealt with the work. And of course how you start is how you end from time to time. I feel the way you start your day uh, lays really heavily across the rest of your day and then the next day and so on and so forth. So even though I am into my metal, I'm into my extreme music and so forth, I don't think anything beats an upbeat, feel-good piece of work that touches you emotionally, that makes you feel like you can take on the world, that makes you feel happy. I don't, I don't think you can beat that. So I think that's something that, uh, you know, sort of is a downside to being into these forms of music. Um, of course, people can disagree. People can disagree because it is an outlet. And it's therapy to some. So, you know, I, I, it's completely open for discussion. I see both sides of things. 
Um, so, uh, me- music critics have often deemed metal lyrics juvenile and banal, and others have objected to what they see as advocacy of misogyny and the occult. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? The occult doesn't necessarily mean, you know what I mean, Any- anything too bad. Uh, as far as misogyny is concerned, I don't know. Look at pop music and how people are presented. Look at how the uh, record executives who run the music game portray certain stereotypes of people and push that into the mainstream. That has an incredible societal reflection. Yeah. And ask yourself if it's intentional or not. So as far as like this little pocket of people, you know what I mean? I think there's bigger issues. Um, Andrew Cope stated that claims... Andrew Cope stated that claims that heavy metal lyrics are misogynistic are clearly misguided as these critics have overlooked the overwhelming evidence that suggests otherwise. Music critic Robert Krasko, uh, you tell me how that's pronounced, called metal an expressive mode that it sometimes seems will be with us for as long as ordinary white boys feel, fear girls, pity themselves and are permitted to rage against the world they'll never be. I can't make sense of that. Music critic Robert called metal an expressive mode an expressive mode that it sometimes seems will be with us for as long as ordinary white boys fear girls it, i don't know am I, am I wrong in saying that's 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 hard to read um metal music i don't know go go to indonesia and see how many white boys are participating in the music circuit there you know what i mean I don't, I don't know, who is this guy? Who is this guy? I take personal offence to this. He's an uh, American music journalist and essayist among the most well-known and influential music critics. He began his career in the late 60s as one of the earliest professional rock critics and then became, uh, yeah, who cares, who cares? Um, I do think that certain pockets of metal music take it too far. Um, in particular, like gore-based bands and so forth, uh, there is a heavy air of misogyny. And I don't say that in regards to, oh, I'm offended by the lyrics. I say that as in, um, I do not separate the art from the artist at times because even though a piece of art can be created to generate attraction and controversy, a person still has to sit there and use their mind to create this. So if you are using your time to create a piece of work that expresses you, you know, uh, sexually enforcing yourself upon vulnerable people, which is just one of many lyrically... Uh, one, of, one of many lyrical concepts that like gore bands um, are more than happy to write about. I will look at you and think you are a bit weird for doing so. That's just the way it is. Uh, the thematic content of heavy metal has long been a target of criticism. I've just read that. Um, heavy metal artists have had to defend their lyrics in front of the US Senate and in court. 85 Twisted Sister frontman D. Snyder was asked to defend this song Under the Blade at a US Senate hearing. At the hearing, the PMRC alleged that the song was about sadomasochism and rape. Snyder stated that the song was about his bandmate's throat surgery. What's this, Under the Blade? It's uh, the debut studio album, but... It was pro- Oh, it was pro- Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, I was going to judge then. I-, I jumped to conclusions. It said it produced by UFA- UFO slash Wasted bassist Pete Way. I was expecting to see uh, bloody Pete Steele pop up. And if I saw Pete Steele pop up, I- I'd-, I'd-, I'd agree with the bloody US Senate. I was going to say, yep, 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 punish him. Um, Snyder stated that song's about blah, blah. In 86, Ozzy Osbourne was sued of the lyrics of his song Suicide Solution. A lawsuit against Osborne was filed by the parents of John McCollum, a depressed teenager who committed suicide allegedly after listening to Osborne's song. Osborne was not found to be responsible for the teen's death. Wow, it it's mad, isn't it? It's mad, it's mad. Um, 
we'll talk about things like that on another time. In 1990, Judas Priest was sued by an American court by the parents of two young men who had shot themselves five years earlier, allegedly after hearing the subliminal statement, Do It, in the band's cover of the song, Better By You, Better Than, but, than Me. While the case attracted a great deal of media attention, it was ultimately dismissed. In 91, UK police seized death metal records from the British record label Earache in an unsuccessful attempt to prosecute the label for obscenity. It's mad. It's mad, in it? Because as you as an artist across the board, disregarding metal, you as an artist, if you want to push the boundaries in one way or another... You are going to have to face the pushback from the system and that's wild, isn't it? Because it's something I've considered as of recent. If you want to be an artist that creates art, i.e. food for thought through one way or another, social media companies aren't going to be happy with you. If you create something controversial... Who's to say a group isn't going to go against you and say, we're cancelling you. We're going to get you fired from your work. And your workplace is just like, even though, even though we aren't too bothered, we can't be taking this, you know, online judgment. We're going to, we're going to have you lose your job. And that's just one of many different directions it can take. So, um, yeah, I think, I think as an artist, it's, it's, it's tough to really create interesting work without sort of just being a, a good natural artist that just appeases to your natural emotion without sort of having you think in an extreme manner because otherwise you become quite dangerous right and uh you know what i mean you have people uh you know feeling ways outside of the status quo and they don't want you thinking that so in some predominantly Muslim countries, heavy metal has been officially denounced as a threat to traditional values. And in countries such as Morocco, Egypt, Lebanon and Malaysia, there have been incidents of heavy metal musicians and fans being arrested and incarcerated. In 97, the Egyptian police jailed many young metal fans and they were accused of devil worship and blasphemy after police found metal recordings during searches of their homes. In 2013... Malaysia banned Lamb of God from performing in their country on the grounds that the band's lyrics could be interpreted as being religiously insensitive and blasphemous. Some people consider heavy metal music to be a leading factor for mental health disorders and that heavy metal fans are more likely to suffer poor mental health but a study from 2009 suggests that this is not true and that fans of heavy metal music suffer from poor mental health at a similar or lower rate compared to the general population. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I I don't know the uh, I don't know the facts, so I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, per personally, uh, casting complete judgment, I, I I would actually think that heavy metal fans and people of like the more extreme metal varieties would, uh, or maybe be more vocal about uh, suffering from bad mental health because. By default, it's very outsider, and when you're not accepted by a group, us being social animals, um, I do think it lays heavy on you. I'm introverted, so I'm speaking from experience. I'm I can't go to clubs and be loud and have a big group of friends and go hardy hardy ha and you know what I mean live life like that. But I do know that they themselves will be covering up their own mental health issue, but it might just not be as clear as these artistic individuals who find ways and vocalize and express it in a different way. Who knows, eh? Um, but yeah, uh, touching the topic in regards to uh, heavy metal being denounced in other places, I do think if that's uh, the culture and, uh, you know, if they are, you know, if there is a heavy religious element and it sort of uh, goes against that, I don't think, I personally don't think there is anything bad than, uh, in regards to standing up for what you believe in and if you are faithful, like, I think it's strength to uh, speak against it. I'm not I'm not one of these people. I'm not religious, but I'm not one of these people who feel like you know what I mean? I, pers personally, I'm from the UK. We it seems like we just roll over and expose our belly to absolutely anything and there is a um, consistent effort to soften up at least young men. So 
I, 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 I think, you know, groups and cultures that stand up for themselves and what they believe in, I, I sort of rate that personally, even if it goes against what I believe in. So fucking be it. Uh, image and fashion. For many artists and bands, let's have a look. We've got a whole article in regards to that, but we'll just uh, have a deek in regards to what it states here. Actually, uh, we've got a main... Uh, let's see how long it is. Not very long. So we'll finish off on this heavy metal fashion. We'll have a look at the main article after. This might just be a section from that. For many artists and bands, visual imagery plays a large role in heavy metal in addition to its sound and lyrics. A heavy metal band's image is expressed in album cover art, logos, stage sets, clothing, design of instruments and music videos. Down the back long hair is the most crucial distinguishing feature of metal fashions. Hey, metalheads, right? When you got into metal, did you start growing your hair out? I did. I've gone through um, several stages of long hair. Man, two times in my life now, I've had hair down here. Especially when I got into metal music. And then I came across punk music and I cut that shit straight off. I was like, well, hardcore is so much better. And I just cut that shit straight off. And then I got got into songwriting and being a, being a free spirit hippie and I grew it out again. Um... So, it's the most crucial distinguishing feature of metal fashion, it states. Originally adopted from the hippie subculture by the 80s and 90s, heavy metal hair symbolised the hate, angst and disenchantment of a generation that seemingly never felt at home. <laughs> According to journalist Nada Rahman, long hair gave members of the metal community the power they needed to rebel against nothing in general. The classic uniform of heavy metal fans consists of light coloured ripped frayed or torn blue jeans, black t-shirts, boots and black leather or denim jackets. Do you know why I said boots? Me, you know, when I got into metal and to this day, boots. I've never seen an incredible emphasis on boots. Um, there's never an open discussion when it comes to metalhead clothing and boots, we talk about merchandise all day long, but boots have never really come into question. Like, of course, you can talk about Doc Martens until you're blue in the face, because that is the boot for alternate people, but I couldn't tell you about many other boots. Uh, of course, when it comes to, like, gothic style and so forth, you've got your new rocks and stuff like that, but I've never had a conversation with any metalhead in regards to boots. And boot brands and so forth. Um, but I do like boots. I do like boots. I'm, I'm a grafter me. So I like steelies. I like steel toe boots. Um, whether it be, you know what I mean? Getting a job done or day to day. I think, I think why the hell not? Functional, they last. And they look half decent with a pair of jeans. You know what I mean? Uh, T-shirts are generally emblazoned with the logos or other visual representations of favourite metal bands. In the 1980s, a range of sources from punk rock and goth music to horror films influenced metal fashion. Many metal performers of the 70s and 80s used radically shaped and brightly coloured instruments to enhance their stage appearance. Let me tell you a story, yeah? Um, the, there was a band called Famine around here. Uh, full of cool fellas. They went from a two-piece to a three-piece band. Uh, they were grind band. Power Violet's grind. Um, drummer, who was a quality guy. He went on to do a dad rock band called Dad Rock. Um, guitarist, cool dude. Went on to go into so many cool bands. Uh, actually started playing in a band called The Afternoon Gentleman, which is an extreme band. Um, pretty good. They're like Power Violet's grind. Within reason, I don't know. I've followed them to this day, but uh, they've got a bit of longevity to that band. And he had a guitar, and he'd just flick a button, and it'd light up this disgusting neon green, yeah? And people would get so excited watching him live in between every song. Do the guitar, do the guitar, do the guitar! And people would be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then, like, midway, if not three quarters through the set, right? The riff comes in before a song. Da -da 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 -da. It'd flip the guitar on. It'd illuminate. Yeah! Everyone would start fucking kicking off. Now that's cool. That's a great novelty. That's a great novelty. If you're in a band, yeah, have a look if you can find yourself a illuminating guitar and the people will be happy. I'm telling you that. Fashion and personal style was especially important for glam metal bands of the era. Performers typically wore long, dyed, hairsprayed, teased hair, hence the nickname hair metal. Interesting. 
Makeup such as lipstick and eyeliner, gaudy clothing included leopard skin printed shirts or vests in tight denim, leather or spandex pants, and accessories such as headbands and jewellery. Pioneered by the heavy metal act X Japan in the late 80s, bands in the Japanese movement those visual K or key, which includes many non-metal group uh, emphasise elaborate costumes, hair and makeup. Never heard of that. The thing is, in the Western world, we don't hear too much about that side of the world when it comes to metal. It's metal or uh, any sort of alternate music. Um, it, we just we just don't hear about it. It's very, very irregular. We hear from bands external to the West. Uh, you know what I mean? Every once in a while, we might get lucky and get a tour, but that's about it. It's always a one-off, and we never really follow it up. I think the language barrier is quite problematic when it comes to that, because obviously, on record, uh, it's hard to get along too well with lyric that isn't understandable. Uh, I don't know anything about X Japan. It's a rock band from Chiba, formed by 82 by drummer and pianist Yoshiki and lead vocalist Toshi. Uh, started as a power speed metal band uh, with heavy symphonic elements. Don't sound like anything I'd be interested in, but, you know, if there's a fan base, I'll check them out. Let's have a little look at the main article. Um, So, the clothing associated with heavy metal has roots in biker, rocker, and leather subcultures. Um, anybody had a leather jacket before? I had one leather jacket, and I felt a bit uncomfortable with it, to be honest. I, I bet I looked like a badass, yeah, but uh, I felt uncomfortable wearing it. It wasn't my style of clothing, and it was, a uh, what would you call it? Uh, who, cares? who cares? Who cares? Heavy metal fashion includes elements such as leather jackets, combat boots, studded belts, high top basketball shoes studded belts were major in the mid 2000s when it came to uh popular hardcore punk and when i say punk you can give or take the punk like scene kid stuff high top basketball shoes more common with old school thrash metal heads blue or black jeans camouflage pants and shorts and denim jackets or cut vests what, what's that Bloody hell, it's got its own way. It's got, I've, I've never looked at that before. Oh, I've never never heard or read that. Often adorned with badges, pins and patches. I had a battle jacket. I've got a hoodie. Absolutely adorned with like gruesome porn grind and gore grind but, um, like logos and stuff. As with the bikers, there is a fascination with Germanic and German imagery, such as the Iron Cross. Distinct aspects of heavy metal fashion. Uh, actually, uh, before we move on from there, uh, you've got to be careful, yeah? Because there is merchandise put out there with uh, imagery and logos uh, that might be worth just avoiding full stop. I had a mate who um, wore a band merchandise, um, a jacket, and he got confronted at a bar by a biker um, who was a participant in a motorcycle group and got told respectfully to remove the item of clothing and respectfully the uh, item of clothing was removed. Because it was in indirect association with this motorcycle group, and obviously they take their logos very seriously. You have to earn your stripes within those communities, so you have to be careful and potentially just avoid that. Especially if you're in a band and want to create uh, merchandise, don't. You know what I mean? It's not. It's not a television program. It's real life. Like you wanna. You wanna avoid patches that might be associated with particular uh, political or, you know. Uh, you know, particular groups, you know. Distinct aspects of heavy metal fashion could be credited to various uh, bands, but the band that takes the most credit for revolutionary the look was Judas Priest. Uh, when I hear about leather, I think of Judas Priest, primarily with its singer Rob Halford. Halford wore a leather costume as early as 80, uh, 78 to coincide with the promotion for The Killing Machine, Hellbent for Leather, in a uh, USA album. In a 98 interview, Halford described the leather subculture as the inspiration for this look. Halford may have been the one to popularise leather, but K.K. Downing, who's that? English guitarist, the former, all oh, right, the guitarist, uh, wanted a look that suited the music that they were creating. Downing stated, Downing started wearing studded leather outfits on stage. Soon, the rest of the band followed. Um, an example of this can be seen from live concert recordings in 78. Downing is the only one on stage appearing with a black studded leather jacket. Not long before other bands appropriated the leather look, Maiden's original singer Paul Diano began wearing leather jackets and studded bracelets. Motorhead innovated with bullet belts. Bro, I had a bullet belt. I had a bullet belt. They're dodgy as hell, in it Because you don't want to get seen by someone who is completely unaware of the subculture, i.e. the majority of people, with a fucking bullet of belts. 
I bought one for like 30 quid back in the day and I sold it off for like 20 quid uh, to my mate because I had no use for it, but they're cool as hell, proper cool. Um, and Saxon introduced spandex. This fashion was particularly popular with followers of the new wave of British heavy metal movement in the 80s and sparked a revival for metal in this era. A studied level look was extended in uh, subsequent variations to the wearing of combat boots, studied leather belts and brakes, uh, blah blah blah, spike gauntlets, etc. The cod piece, however, appears to be less popular among the general public. Um, yeah, I've not ever seen anyone wear a cod piece. I did have a mate who wore chainmail though, literally wore chainmail on his day to day. Um, that that's quite a, quite a good novelty. Some of the influences of modern military clothing and the Vietnam War can be seen by the fans of bands such as Thrash Metal, with the members of Thrash Metal bands in the eighties like Metallica, Destruction, and Megadeth wearing bullet belts around their waists on stage. It is likely that the Thrash Metal bands got their idea of wearing bullet belts from new wave of British heavy metal bands such as Motorhead who have incorporated the bullet belt as part of their aesthetic since their inception. Since many thrash metal bands... Man, I bet it was hard to get a bullet belt from the get-go. You know what I mean? Whoever whoever started that trend or helped uh, get that trend moving, and whoever was making them bullet belts, I bet made a killing back in the day. To this day, if you make bullet belts, I bet you make a killing. Whoa, that... I'm, I'm going to start a bullet belt shop. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to start a bullet belt shop. Uh, this style often connected to punk metal and anti-fashion as akin to the hardcore punk scene as the aforementioned style reflects similar attitudes. German heavy metal band except ex-lead uh, singer Udo Dirk Schneider also contributed to the military clothing by wearing military pants from 82, being considered as the first heavy metal musician to wear them. Fans of glam metal often have long or very long teased hair and are dressed in spandex pants and or leather jackets. They also may use, though not necessarily, some makeup, lipsticks, eyeshadows, tonal creams, etc. I don't know too many metalheads who took the makeup route. I don't know too many of them. Uh, I used to wear hairspray though. Uh, back, back during the scene era, scene kids and all of that. I used to wear hairspray. Uh, bands who play in glam metal uh, genre may have instruments with extravagant colours and attributes like guitars with pink Dalmatian or pink rose colours microphone stands were often a leopard or so, uh, alright who cares uh, the imagery and values of historic Celtic Saxon Viking and chivalric culture is reflected in heavily in metal music by bands such as Blind Guardian has an, had its impact uh, upon the everyday fashion and especially the stage gear of metal artists the independence masculinity and honour of the warrior ethos, ethos is extremely popular amongst metalheads. That's very true, as is the rejection of perceived modern-day consumerist and metrosexual culture. Beards, long hair like a lion, in the imagery, muscles, uh, very accented, especially in power metal and such like that. So I, I completely agree. You see a lot of uh, masculine aesthetic in metal music imagery at the very least. Folk metal, Viking metal, black metal and power metal fans often grow long thick hair and beards reminiscent of a stereotypical Viking, Saxon or Celt and wear false hammer pendants and other pagan symbols. On stage, in photo shoots and in music videos, it is very common for bands of these genres such as Cherisas and Moon Sorrow to wear chain mail, animal skins, war paint such as Woad and other Dark Ages themed battle gear. Woad is what? It's a flowering plant, so if, I guess you make, uh, you know, whatever you make out of it. Corpse paint is another style of black and white paint. Uh, yo, people, corpse paint, if you're a metalhead, yeah, such an easy Halloween outfit. Such an easy Halloween. It just goes a black metalhead, mate. Uh, I've seen corpse paint at events before. It, it always looks foolish. It always looks foolish. Corpse paint is another style of black and white makeup, usually mainly by black metal bands to insinuate one's appearance. Let me tell you something. Uh, in imagery and artwork, as long as the aesthetic's right, it can be quite cool. I think... Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach both sides here. Generally speaking, I feel like taking your time to apply such a, a amount of theatrical makeup... Um, during performing through whichever means I think it detracts from the organic artistry you're trying to portray because it creates a mask 
which separates you from the consumer. Uh, and yeah, I say consumer because that's your market, that's your audience. If you want to be successful, if you want to have somebody feel your message, I feel like you don't want to create ob obstacles and boundaries and barriers. And if you want to be mysterious as a musician, yeah, it does have its pros and cons. And when I say I'll play it from both sides, I have seen a band, I saw a band called Black Witchery, yeah. Um, the front man looked wild as hell and he had cops paint stuff and I think it enhanced him. Uh, so I do think there is, you know, if it goes hand in hand with the character and the portrayal and the, you know, elusivity of the music and so forth, I think it does work. But generally, you know, I don't like, I guess we all play dress up in some sort of way, definitely. But I think over accentuating it removes from the music. But if the music isn't that good, then I guess it amplifies the music. There we go. Um... So that's corpse pain. Uh, da, 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 da. It's another style of black and white makeup, uh, mainly used by black metal bands to insinuate one's appearance as dead or not from this world. It is often composed of a white layer covering a person's face with black details on top, often in the shape of crosses or around the eyes. Bands such as Cradle of Filth and Kiss have stated that this has been worn as a homage to early silent black and white horror movies. Wow. Black metal fans also spot goatees. Oh, <laughs> like um, LeVay. All black uh, outfits, leather jackets, sometimes with black and white band patches sewed on, spikes, jewellery, facial piercings and boots. Hey, I'll tell you what, if you get into it, you get into it, but that, that devilish stuff is nothing to laugh at. Hey, if, you, if you're into black metal, I won't play with the devil, man, because there are some organisations out there who aren't messing about, that's for sure, that is for sure. And they may or may not be involved with black metal music. Uh, power metal fans and musicians such as Rhapsody of Fire are often wear attire reminiscent of the Renaissance in the Middle Ages, including tight black or brown leather trousers and wide sleeve buttonless shirts of various colours. The imagery of bards and minstrels, as well as knights, is a popular part of power metal fashion. Some stoner metal bands and fans have incorporated retro looks. Boot cut or bell bottom jeans, headbands and tie dye are other colourful shirts inspired by the 60s and 70s. Psychedelic rock as well as cannabis culture. New metal fashion includes baggy metal pants or cargo shorts, borrowing from hip hop culture, spiked hair or dreadlocks, and an abundance of accessories. Also notable is that the dark business suit now relates to some metal bands, most often doom, gothic, or stoner acts. Bands such as Acrecock, if that's how you pronounce it, Although the band is death metal, the vision bleak, lacrimosa, motionless in white, flesh god apocalypse, flesh god, flesh god. I've seen flesh god a couple of times, probably more than a couple of times. Northern Kings, although the band is symphonic metal, uh, um, Northern Kings uh, was also a uh, demo or an EP by a band called Brutality Will Prevail, like a doom infused hardcore metal band. Uh, from around here, which is worth checking out. People, if you're into metal music at the very least, I would check, if you want to hear something unique, listen to the band Brutality Will Prevail and listen to their album, Root of All Evil. Trust me, that's a recommendation from me. Root of All Evil by Brutality Will Prevail. Later on, they got a different from man and it became a lot more basic because a lot of the unique factor was the Welsh front man and his vocal style i would recommend that a lot although the band is informal uh da, 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 are known for use of formal clothing and music videos and stage performances sometimes followed by fans well there you go people we've just had a look at heavy metal fashion uh i think this video is long enough for you so next we're going to delve deeper in we're going to look at subcultures physical gestures whatever that means probably throwing the horns and so forth and then in due time we're going to have a look at the history geez louise so uh hold on tight people i'm signing out